I think let's get going. Uh, All right. I, I'll kick it off if you want. Yes, please. All right. I always feel funny doing this because many of you guys have sat through many, many, many of our lectures, but we've always got some newbies. So for you guys that have tuned in with us many times before, just bear with me as we do the usual welcome and stuff like that. Welcome to JAM, everybody. The Global Initiative for Expert Manual Therapists. As I mentioned earlier, Dr. Singh and I were previously teaching with another platform. The platform was insufficient and not good enough. And I think that there were too many things keeping it from growing and going in the right direction. And so here we are with this brand new platform in which we hope to continue what we started. And for many of you that have tuned with us so many times, it's really a compliment. We love that you guys are joining us again. We love having you guys. We've developed some good, you know, bit, um, you know, friendships, relationships, and stuff like that. Um, and we we really foster those. We really cherish those. Um, the idea behind Gem is that we want to make physical therapists and physiotherapists all over the world better. We want to be able to provide top quality education content um, for people that tune in. At a, at a price that's affordable, at a price that's doable. And that's different in every country and, and stuff like that. Dr. Singh and I were actually finalizing the application for our first course that we're going to teach here in the USA. It's going to be our SI course. It's the exact same course that you guys are going to be getting um, later this year. So we're really excited about that. Um, but yeah, it's so the idea behind GEM again is to provide education that helps make physiotherapists better, that helps you guys get better results from your patients, that helps physiotherapists to be able to see past a basic diagnosis and be able to see the bigger picture and be able to treat the hard, difficult diagnoses. So we've done we've done a couple of free lectures now. We've done how do you treat plantar fasciitis that isn't plantar fasciitis? And the majority of the time, plantar fasciitis is not plantar fasciitis. There's neural involvement. There's a branch of the sciatic nerve that can be generating symptoms. And if that's the case, you have to treat the sciatic nerve. You have to treat the pelvis. You have to treat the back. And the moment you do that, you can take a patient. I have so many times. You can take a patient who has failed physical therapy. They've failed chiropractic. They failed cupping. They failed um, physiotherapy. They failed massage therapy. They've tried to treat themselves by buying night splints and heel lifts and massaging the foot using an ice bottle and doing calf stretches and doing towel curls and stuff like that. And they fail to the point that they've given up or they're just throwing money at different interventions now. They're thinking about having a surgery. They've seen the foot doctor, they've seen the podiatrist, and they come to you, and in one or two sessions, you can take them from a constant eight out of 10 for the last five years down to like a two out of 10, one out of 10, because you're treating the problem. We call it the cause of the cause of the problem. That's one, that's one common diagnosis where we see this at the knee. We did, mis we, we, we did mysterious knee pain. Um, last weekend, where we talked about how medial knee pain can be caused by L3, L4 issues in the lumbar spine, via which nerve? Via the saphenous nerve. And I've had so many knee pain patients where I have not had to touch their knee to treat it and to get it better. So many patients. And these are the patients that are leaving me reviews. These are the patients that are coming back to me. These are the patients that are sending me their family members. These are the patients that are telling their doctors about me. And they say, that guy is different. That guy knows something that my other therapists don't know. We want to take the physiotherapists that we touch, that we influence, and we want to give you guys a higher level of knowledge. We're not coming at you guys with basic stuff. And if it's complicated, I'm sorry. If it's a little bit complicated, you know, to follow and to track, I'm sorry. It is. Some of these things are complicated. When we get, when we hit SI joint, I apologize in advance. The stuff that we teach on SI joint is probably the most complex things that I deal with on, on, a, on a regular basis at my work is dealing with the mental gymnastics of the SI joint stuff. Um, but everything else, you know, honestly, 
I think we make it easy. I think we make difficult concepts easy. That's one of our goals. Um, so another diagnosis uh, that we can talk about today, Dr. Singh is going to get into it, but it's it's a situation where a patient can have pain in their arm or in the front of their chest that's caused by a rib dysfunction in the upper in the upper thoracic spine and rib cage. And it's funny because Dr. Singh has several case studies he's going to present and talk about today. And um, while every patient is different, these patients are all going to have a couple of things in common that help give away, um, you know, where this, where the origin of the symptoms are coming from. And certainly we want you guys to pay attention because you will, I promise you, I promise you every single person who's been a physiotherapist for at least one year, you guys have all seen these patients that I'm talking about. You have seen a knee pain patient. Where, they're, where their saphenous nerve and their low back was generating their pain. You've seen a plantar fasciopathy patient where their symptoms was really being driven from the low back and from the pelvis. And you've probably seen one of these patients we're going to talk about today where they've got a rib dysfunction that's irritating an intercostal brachial nerve that's generating symptoms in the arm and sometimes in the front of the chest. And a lot of these patients will have had cardiac workup they're thinking they're having they're thinking they're having a heart attack and they'll be checked for so many different things and finally they, finally they walk into your clinic and they said nobody knows my cardiologist says i'm fine i've seen this chiropractor they can't do anything for me i've seen this person this person this person and nobody knows one of dr singh's uh this this quote that he's going to talk about in just a little bit it's incredible but it's it's so funny because we see it and we do it on a daily basis not a week goes by at my clinic that I don't have a patient that has been treated by other therapists and we're able to cut through the rubbish, find the problem and get them better. How do we get to that level? So when I was a new physiotherapist in my head, in my head, I thought, you know, as a new physiotherapist, there are some things that maybe I'm not good at that I'm not comfortable treating, but I think I can get 80% of my patients. I think I can do like a really good job right? I think I can do a good job with 80% of my patients. And I started having patients that I was having difficulties with, troubles with. And one of my mentors, um, one of my mentors, I would ask her help. I would ask her to come over and help me with patients. And I swear she would take my patient and she would, in, in two minutes, talk to the patient, test the patient, treat the patient using manual therapy technique, either manipulation, mobilization, muscle energy technique, and the patient would go from eight out of 10 to zero out of 10. And I saw it time, time and time and time again. And I said, I feel so insufficient. I also feel like I'm wasting my time. I feel like I'm wasting the patient's time. I need to know what she knows. And so just like Dr. Singh, I embarked on the journey to do a fellowship program, which is additional education beyond the basic, beyond entry-level physical therapy degree additional education, and uh, the fellowship program, which requires hands-on training, right? We're doing hands-on training, and also you're going to work with a physiotherapist that's tip-top, and they're going to scrutinize you. You work with them for a few weeks, and they're going to they're watch you. They're going to discuss cases with you. They're going to they're gonna say, you need to change your hands. You need to do the manipulation like this is better. Your body posture needs to be like this. Yes, this patient has symptoms here, but we need to treat it over here. And this is this is the process that I went through, that Dr. Singh went through, that took us from being run-of-the-mill, average, vanilla physical therapists and put us at the pinnacle. And when I go marketing to doctors, I tell them there, I with confidence, there's not another therapist like me for, for miles. I'm the best. And I mean that in the most humble way possible, but I just want you to know because I want to take care of your patients. If you have patients that are having problems that have failed physical therapy, you send them to me because I don't want them to get unnecessary surgeries. I don't want them to have uh, chronic pain that doesn't go away and stuff like that. And so this model of advanced education with hands-on training, that's eclectic. It means we're going we're gonna to be talking about Mulligan. We're going to be talking about McKenzie. We're going to be talking about osteopathic techniques. And osteopathic techniques is going to trump, it's going to be better than anything and everything chiropractic. So anything and everything chiropractic, we're going to address 
but from an osteopathic standpoint, because we don't believe that all pathologies in the body start from a malalignment of the spine. Diabetes does not start from a malalignment of the spine. You don't cure cancer by manipulating the spine, but we do deal with musculoskeletal pain by dealing with the spine, joint dysfunctions, malalignments, subluxations, and things like that. And so I cannot tell you guys, this is the best of the best. If you want to be a one-stop shop physiotherapist, you guys should stick with us because we're going to come at it from a manual therapy. We're going to be teaching you guys the best exercises that are out there, evidence-based exercises. We're going to get into dry needling. And then we're going to cover the entire body. We're going to cover the entire body, even things like TMJ. You know, we'll get into so many different things anyways. So on this slide, there's a, there's a phrase called the clinician's high. The clinician's high is what I've been alluding to this whole time. It's when you get excited when you're able to help a patient that somebody else was not able to help. Maybe their doctor wasn't able to help them, or maybe they've been trying you know, natural remedies or Google's 10 best back exercises, and they're not able to help themselves, and you're able to help them. That's big. But are you the kind of physical therapist that fixes other physical therapists' mistakes and failures. Because the reality is that the quality of physical therapy varies so much. And I'm not just saying it varies so much from this country to that country. I'm saying it varies so much everywhere. From where I am right now, I promise you there's like 10 physical therapy clinics within a two kilometer radius. And the majority of those physical therapy clinics are not practicing at the level that we are going to elevate our students to. You guys will really stand out. And I think you'll enjoy it in, in the process. You know, the, the learning is fantastic. The, the stuff that we're going to bring is fantastic. I'm, I'm going to get off my soapbox now. Obviously, I get super excited and hyped up about this kind of stuff because I have lived that. I have been there and I've taken the journey and now I'm here and I love it so much. I'm teaching. I'm a... <laughs> Um, I'm an introverted person by nature, and I don't like being in front of people and stuff like that. But when it comes to physiotherapy, I'm passionate about it because I've seen the difference that it makes. And we love it. We love helping people. So anyways, without any further ado, I'll uh, let Dr. Uh, Tajinder Singh take it away. Okay, so we're going to talk about clinicians. Hi. So this is, uh, this is an unfortunate situation where a patient has gone to different clinics or different different physicians or maybe like orthopedic doctor, maybe a primary physician, maybe a podiatrist, and they have exhausted all the resources. So this is a this is a quote from a patient I saw very recently in the clinic and he came to me and he said, I've done everything. I'm not sure whether you can help me. And if your approach is based on clinical reasoning, it's based on evidence-based practice, it's based on hands-on manual therapy skills, you can help most of your patients, okay? Okay, we're gonna talk about this diagnosis because this diagnosis falls into the same category where these people will go misdiagnosed or undiagnosed for years, mm -hmm. okay? We're gonna talk about intercostal brachial neuralgia. We're gonna talk, talk about st this stuff because it is rare and bizarre. And I published a study last year about this because I think this is, people need to know about this diagnosis more because we see in the clinic, this diagnosis in the clinic all the time, all the time. And these people go to, these people go to patients, these people go to different physicians, different doctors, and they don't get help, okay? The foundational article, to this, this diagnosis is by sores. And I will try to explain this because this is a little complex stuff. So what did, what sores did, they, it was a dissectional study. They took like 100 axilla, then they, they dissected it. And then they were trying to find whether your thoracic nerves, your mid thoracic nerves communicates with your arm or not, okay? So they found that in 99% of the cases, your T2, T2 was communicating with the arm. In 61% of the patients, your 
T3 was communicating with the arm. And in only 3% of the patients, he found T4 communicating with the arm. I'll try to explain this better just by going back to our foundational education. All of us know that brachial plexus start from C5 to T1, okay? So your arm primarily is supplied by this, even if you have a post-fixed plexus, which starts from C6 to T2, okay? So idly below T2, your problems should not go in the arm unless you have presence of an anatomic anomaly where your T4 is supplying your arm now. Okay. And that confuses a lot of physicians because patients will tell pain like in thoracic spine and also tell pain in the arm, mm -hmm. which is, which confuses a lot of physicians because they would never think it as a nerve problem. Okay. Okay. So this is your intercourse to break your lungs. It's a thin strip in your chest. Okay. And it is supplying it is going from an intercostal nerve and supplying the arm through medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm. If you guys know where the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm, going back to the brachial plexus, it comes from your medial cord and lower trunk, the supply is CAT1. So there's an intercostal nerve, there's a nerve coming from thoracic spine attaching to the brachial plexus, okay? Okay, and if you dissect the elbow or it is usually found somewhere here, I'm talking about medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm, which comes from your lower trunk, medial cord, okay? And patients will report pain here or numbness here or dull achy pain here, okay? Possible differential diagnosis, and this slide is very, very complex. I can spend like an hour on it, but I'll try to dumb it down and try to explain this. So. If a patient comes to you and they say, I have pain here, okay? Either it can be coming from a median nerve entrapment around the pronator teres muscle. It can also be coming from an interior interosseous nerve entrapment, which is called kilo Nguyen syndrome. If you guys know, anterior interosseous nerve is a motor branch of median nerve, okay? Mm -hmm. It can also be coming from your neck. And that's where physicians get confused because what they do is patient reports pain here. They do MRIs. MRIs will so show some disc bulges. And all of us know that disc bulges are false positive for a lot of conditions. And they, they start treating the neck without even, a, without even knowing the existence of this problem. Okay. Your golfer's elbow can, can also cause pain on the middle side of the elbow. And then you have middle cord syndrome and then ulnar neuropathy because your ulnar nerve supply is also the middle side of the forearm and a lower trunk entrapment can do the same, okay? So patient reporting pain here, you have, to, you have to differentially diagnose all these problems, okay? And you can only do that if you have deep understanding of the musculoskeletal system, okay? okay. Let's talk about how the symptoms present, okay? So your patient will have paresthesias, which means sensory loss, and dull, achy pain, burning pain in the upper arm. So they'll report pain here, okay? And sometimes they'll also report like chest pain, okay? So chest pain and pain on the middle side of the forearm, arm, forearm, okay? And what happens when I go to a primary physician, I report pain in the chest. The first thing they would do is ECG, this person has angina pectoris, okay? Mm -hmm. Or they will go through a nerve conduction test where they'll try to find where this person has like numbness, tingling and dull, achy, throbbing, burning. I might try that, okay? Or this patient would need a chest X-ray or a chest biopsy or maybe MRI because C6, C7 or C5, C6 supply areas around your elbow, okay? Where is the problem? Because first, most of us don't know about this diagnosis. There is absence of clinical criteria. There are no clinical prediction rules to talk about this condition. Mm -hmm. Very, very complex anatomy because from our foundational sciences, our foundational education, 
we don't we don't know whether t2 t3 t4 can supply the arm but it can okay and then presence of unknown and rare anatomical variations and we'll, we'll talk about a couple of case studies and that this will explain you very well so case study one and this was i think i'll sh also share the article we published so this was an asian female 42 year old very very interesting patient she reported pain on the middle side of the forearm arm forearm and the symptoms were going on for two years patient has type 2 diabetes but the symptoms were just localized to this area okay she had a left lymph node removal surgery 11 so she had some surgery in the axilla 11 years ago okay the crazy part of this patient is that she went to the physician and then went to the orthopedic surgeon she had a nerve conduction test done which was positive and she ended up having a surgery to c6 c7 we, which did not fix her symptoms. So you have a patient who's reporting pain in the arm, went to the doctor, had a surgery done, but symptoms still persist. Okay. Then the patient came to me and these were the findings. We checked ULTT, all uh, everything was fine, upper lip tension test, negative for radian, radial median ulnar. I will show some of the testing so that you guys, if you see that in the clinic, again, it's it's a very, very simple way to diagnose this. If you see that in the clinic again, uh, you will be able to you will be able to diagnose it just by manual palpation by hands on hands on scales. Okay. Okay. I will I will demonstrate some rib palpation and rib springing on second and third rib. Okay. Okay, just give me one second. I'll, I'll do the setup and then I will demonstrate this. Okay. Dr. Steve didn't come here. Yeah, I'm going to lay face down. Yeah, face down here. Okay. So I'm going to show you. There, okay. So my patient is reporting pain down the left arm, okay, in front of the medial side of the arm. And if I find the third rib, which you can find right next to the spine of the scapula, and just find that rib angle, if I can reproduce the patient's symptoms by just doing a little springing there, there is no other structure I should be hitting on. Okay, I'm doing a little springing on the third rib angle and my patient is reporting pain down the arm. Can you tell me any other structure that should give this kind of presentation? So I'm just doing, all I'm doing is palpating the third rib and doing a little springing. And my patient is, I'm able to produce patient's, patient's symptoms. Okay, or reproduce patient symptoms. Okay. Okay. Any questions with this? So all you have to do is find the spine of the scapula, go medially towards the spine, and I think you will be able to find the third rib angle. Are you guys able to see? Okay. All you have to do is put your pisciform on it and just do a little springing 
And if you can reproduce patients' symptoms with this, you definitely, there is no other structure that should radiate pain from third rib to medial elbow. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Steve. <clears throat> yeah. Any questions regarding this? Have you guys seen this in the clinic ever? Not continuous pressure giving. Springing means you press, you release, you press, you release. Just to see whether when you release, the symptoms go away. And when you press, symptoms come on. Yeah. Has anybody seen this in the clinic before? No, Have sir. you ever? Yes. Okay, great. I think this patient has seen you, you just haven't seen them. That's what I say always, because this is more common than you think. And this problem sometimes coexists with T4 syndrome, which we'll talk about in one of the courses in future, near future. So this, this problem sometimes coexists with T4 syndrome, which is thoracic pain and sy sympathetic up, up regulation. Okay. 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 So talking about this, you have a nerve, cutaneous nerve that supplies the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm and it can get entrapped between the second and third rib. So if, if I do springing on second and third rib and I can elicit patient's symptoms, that can also be a treatment. If I can treat second and third rib, I can fix this patient, okay? I will show you what I did with this patient and I think I was able to find good results in few few settings. So because the, because the nerve is getting entrapped between second and third rib, that's what you need to treat. You can do some muscle energy techniques to improve posterior translation. You can manipulate the second, second and third rib. You can also treat the secondary dysfunctions. If I go back, I did talk about restriction in T3, T4, T2, T3, okay? And I also spoke about, spoke about restrictions in upper cervical C01 mea dysfunction and closing dysfunction of C12, okay? So with this comprehensive approach, treating the upper cervical spine, your thoracic spine and second and third rib, you can easily, easily address this patient. I will share that article with you, which we published. And I think you can, that article has a lot of treatment ideas. It talks about absence of clinical criteria. It talks about how you can diagnose and treat. And you just don't have to treat second and third, but you have to treat secondary dysfunctions that are associated with it because, because you don't want the symptoms to come back. Okay. And then, this all patient also has a history of lymph node removal surgery, okay? It won't hurt if you do some soft tissue work on lower trunk of the brachial plexus, okay? The article I will share with you also talks about, talks about axillary cording, okay? You, you're, if you have history of breast removal surgery or you have history of mastect some form of mastectomy, talks about rhomboid dominance. We'll talk about rhomboid dominance. I can actually tell you what rhomboid dominance is. So if my patient is sitting like this and I ask my patient to do active external rotation, okay? Ideally, this should, this should, this should primarily come from your infraspinatus teres minor. But if your scapula starts moving within first 50% of range of- You're not audible, sir. exercises we can do to improve rhomboid dominance. Dr. Singh? Yep. I think it cut out for a little bit. Can you just repeat starting from the rhomboid dominance test? Okay, so we'll talk about rhomboid dominance again. So 90-90 position, you 
you go and do ask the patient to do a bilateral external rotation and you keep one hand on the shoulder blade and see if the shoulder moves within first 50% of the range. Okay. If shoulder move, shoulder blade moves within the first 50% of the range, that is a sign of rhomboid dominance, which means that this motion should, which should be done by primarily your dynamic stabilizers of the shoulder, which are your intraspinatus and titerius minor for external rotation, is done by rom by is done by rhomboid, major and minor. Okay. And that happens. We, we see these movement pattern deficits in we see these movement pattern deficits in lower extremity where your patients are hamstring dominant, quad dominant. And this this rhomb rhomboid dominant should also be addressed. Okay. We can demonstrate this a positive and a negative in the lab breakout here in a little bit. Okay, yeah, we can. Okay, I'm going to talk about my patient too. And on this patient, I think I, I can never forget this patient because I think I had, yeah, there's, there's certain patients you don't forget. I, I think I saw her like seven or eight years ago and I still remember her name, still remember what the presentation was just because the presentation was, presentation was very, very interesting. So she was from Germany. She was living in Texas and she was referred to PT with medial left arm pain and forearm pain with some dull achiness in, in the chest, like, like look, like third and fourth, fourth and fifth intercoastal space. Also had some back pain, which she was not very concerned about. And I think she was at an age, like a young age where people getting like heart attacks in their forties and stuff. So in the last, I think year or so, she went to the ER urgent care and had like three ECGs done. Because whenever, whenever you have chest pain, you think it's angina. And two chest breast biopsies done because they thought it's a tumor or a, or, or a carcinoma. So three ECGs, two chest biopsies. And I saw her, this patient was not in a very good mental state because she was very disturbed. And she, was, she felt like she was being thrown around by different physicians, Dr. A, Dr. B, Dr. Two, Dr. Three, Dr. Four, Dr. Five, and then, Nobody is giving her answers. Says, what's going on? She couldn't sleep at night. I mean, she was seeing a counselor because this affected her mental health so much. So very, very interesting patient, patient presentation. Chest pain and so the symptoms. If you look at the position of the heart, your heart is usually on the left side of the sternum. The patient had symptoms on the left side. And primarily it sits from second or third intercoastal space to the fifth intercoastal space. So her symptoms were right there. Okay. And this, these were the findings. I saw her, she had no neck issues. I mean, cervical screening was negative. Upper limb tension test was negative. I could reproduce her symptoms in the arm with fourth and fifth rib which your fourth and fifth T4, T5 has no business supplying your arm, right? But if you go back to the article by Sears, who did this, this study, he says that 3% of people can, can, have, can have T4 connection to the forearm or arm. So it can be possible, it's rare, 3% of the population can have your T4 supplying your arm and forearm. And I, I mean, when I saw her, I could not believe myself. I said, I'm doing a rip springing on T4 and you're reporting pain down the arm. That makes absolute no sense. But it, it does. She just falls into the rare category of 3% people where your T4 can also supply the arm and forearm. Okay. And she definitely she had some restrictions in thoracic spine T2, T3, T3, T4, T4, T5, T5, T6. Okay. Lumbar pelvic exam showed some dysfunctions, like le left pelvic upslip. And these were silent dysfunctions. She was not even concerned about it. If you're if you're suspecting a heart problem, you're not gonna be worried about back pain, you know. So and all this time everybody told her either she has breast carcinoma or some form of breast tumor, or some form of silent heart problem, which is not detected on ECG. So she was in a panic mode when I saw her. So 
The interesting thing is, as a manual therapist, if you know how to treat fourth and fifth rib, you can definitely address this. So we treated the fourth and fifth rib dysfunction. We did some muscle energy, some manipulations of the fourth and fifth rib, manipulation mobilization to the thoracic spine. And then we also worked on the back because she had some silent dysfunction. Then we were able to actually help her. So that was beautiful because this patient was in a panic mode. Very, very interesting. And, okay. and I was confused too as a therapist just because we don't think T4 should supply your arm, but in certain patients it does. And if you don't know about it, that's the last thing we're looking at it, you know? So can I, Dr. Singh, can I jump in real quick? Yes, please. Relating to what you're talking about. <clears throat> so Dr. Singh's talking about how, you know, he treated her primary problem, fixed the primary problem, and they did do some looking in some other places at the pelvis and found like a, that there was an upslip of the SI joint and um, that they even though she was not having symptoms that he chose to treat that. And that's called a silent dysfunction. So when we find hypomobility or a malalignment or a subluxation and the patient's not having pain from that, but we can see that it's not right. And this is actually common in rib dysfunctions as well. A lot of times when I'm screening a thoracic spine, I'll find rib dysfunctions and the patient may not complain of pain there, but as soon as you start springing the rib, poking at the rib, you know, one out of, you know, the 24 different ribs, one of them is malaligned, it's prominent, it's tender, it's hypomobile, and this is a dysfunction, and we should, typically, I do go ahead and treat it. But this, and this is just a hypothetical mental gymnastics exercise, if the patient has an upslip on one side, that means that when they're standing, and when they're sitting, the foundation for their spine is not level anymore. It's going to be tilted to one side. As soon as the pelvis is tilted to one side, the lumbar spine has to, through Friat's laws, right? It has to side bend, it has to rotate. And so if the foundation for your spine is off, guess what? Your lumbar spine will move into a scoliosis. Your thoracic spine will move into a scoliosis. Your neck will move into a scoliosis. This is one of the things that can predispose a patient to issues higher up the kinetic chain and issues lower down the kinetic chain. And it can wreak havoc. So, so I'm not saying this is the case, but hypothetically, this silent SI dysfunction that puts her thoracic spine and her rib cage in an abnormal asymmetrical position, this could drive neck pain, headaches, pinched nerve. It can drive rib dysfunction. When you flex, extend, and side bend your thoracic spine, the ribs have to move um, with that. And if you have a thoracic scoliosis and your ribs are sitting in a certain position all of the time, even if it's small, even if it's subtle, your ribs can get stuck in that position or get jammed into either inspiration or expiration and they get stuck there. And when they get stuck there, they can begin to generate symptoms either around the shoulder blade, the chest, or even down into the arm through intercostal brachial nerve. And so sometimes to treat the patient holistically, even when we're dealing with thoracic spine and ribs and arm pain, sometimes it's important that we look down into the pelvis and the low back. And this is, this is not only holistic treatment for your patient, and, 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 and you're treating the patient to the best of your abilities because you're covering all the bases, but also too, it is another, it's a way for you to generate additional visits from this patient. This is not primary. My primary goal is not to make money. And that may be different from some people and that's fine. My primary goal is to give the patient the absolute best care that I can give them. And if that results in me seeing the patient for a few more visits and treating some different things, then fine, that's great. But like I said, my primary goal is the absolute best top tier care of your patient. And when you do that, that's when you start getting more patients, more referrals, better business, more clinics, et cetera, et cetera. Anyways, I just wanted to throw that out there, Dr. Singh. So, yeah, I mean, the idea here is that going back to my favorite term here. Yeah. So I'm going to go back to this. So if you can address patients like these, and that's why we discuss complex patients where patients have been not finding the solution to their complex problems and they have seen multiple physicians if you can if you can do a good job here and 
diagnose and treat accurately and specifically. And the, the funny thing is, funny thing with manual therapy is, if you treat the right thing, if you treat the right thing, you can find results in a very, very short amount of time. Like patient might go to therapy for like 20 visits, but if you, if you know what you're doing, you, in one or two visits, you can produce a significant change in their symptoms. And just that significant improvement can guide your care. Yeah, okay, okay. We'll demonstrate some of the techniques now, which we, not all, but some of the techniques. And if you have any questions regarding any of the techniques or any of the stuff being discussed, because we wanna spend time on showing you stuff, okay? So we'll talk a little bit about rhomboid dominance here and we'll, we'll show you some of the manipulations and stuff. Okay. Let me call my patient and I think I can show you some of the techniques. Okay. Dr. Steve? Yeah, coming. Yeah. I want to show them how about dominance. So. So people are asking why rhomboid dominance. So let me explain this. So all of us are like neurally wired differently. We have like preferential patterns of how we move. Some people are hamstring dominant. Some people are quad dominant. Rhomboid dominance means that we are, we are using rhomboids to move to move the shoulder or they're taken over the role of the rotator cuff muscles. Okay. So I will show you how to, how to find rhomboid dominance. Okay. Uh, it's probably with the camera here. Dr. Steve Damon is sitting facing that. No, just face that way. Yeah. My patient is sitting here. It's a very, very easy, simple test. And I'm glad he's wearing. You can probably see the. Sh All you have to do is ask the patient. Do, and you can keep one hand, one hand on the inferior angle of the scapula. Ask the patient to do the slow rotation. Yeah. You start. You feel that this they they start moving the shoulder blade towards the spine within first fifty percent of the range of motion. That's positive for rhomboid dominance. Yeah. I don't see much movement here, but I mean, let me exaggerate it. So you can exaggerate it. He's gonna show you how it should look like. Can you see okay? Yep. Oh. Can you see how this is rhomboid dominance? He's now he's trying to produce rhomboid dominance. And that's that's how it should look like. So there's like this versus that. Yeah. Can you guys see it? And I appreciate this. Dr. Ford, do you mind showing it one more time? Yeah. So let me demonstrate a negative finding. So negative finding would be there's nice external rotation and the shoulder blade is not moving in the first 50% of the external rotation. A positive where the patient is rhomboid dominant is we see shoulder blade movement early on. So we see shoulder blade movement early on. In the, in the first 50% of movement. So if a patient has 80 degrees of external rotation within the first 40 degrees, we see the shoulder blade start to kick in. They're driving that with their rhomboid. Yeah. So the, the treatment is very simple. You have to break this pattern, patient education, and you have to train the prime movers, which are your external rotators of the shoulder with without using the shoulder blade. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about how to, how to address second and third rib, fourth rib, fifth rib with the muscle energy technique. Okay. So my patient came in and I was palpating the third rib and this was, I find it to be posterior compared, find it to be posterior compared to the opposite side. Okay, so the muscle energy technique we use is we ask the patient to 
keep the hand. We went showing you. So this is the hand placement. And then you keep it like this. This is the affected side. This is the affected side. Okay. Okay. And we went. And now I can. So, so if the left side is posterior, I'm going to make like a grip like this. Okay. And I'm going to keep it on the rib angle. Okay. And I will. I will resist the elbow on the opposite side. Okay. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to translate the rib anteriorly. Demonstrate from behind as well. Yeah. So, yeah. so I'm pushing that rib anteriorly and I am resisting the opposite side of the elbow. And that's a muscle energy technique for a posterior posteriorly translated third, fourth, fifth rib. Yeah. First and second is hard to palpate, hard to do with this one because they are not, they're, they're atypical ribs. But for typical ribs, this is a great technique to address rib dysfunctions. Okay. Also called as costotransverse dysfunction. So you're trying to address a costotransverse dysfunction. Another way to diagnose a costotransverse dys dysfunction is patient will report pain with side bending. Okay. Patient will report pain with side bending. Okay, and if it's a facet dysfunction, patient will pain report pain with rotation, eat to the either side. Okay, so rib dysfunction is very simple. If a patient reports pain with classic side bending, that's a rib dysfunction or a costal transverse dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Okay. The research likes the research likes when I was studying for orthopedic clinical specialist, they like this side bending test to rule in rib dysfunction. I like that test for me personally. I also like a cluster. It's just a cluster that I kind of made up clinically, but basically it's there's asymmetry, there's tenderness to palpation of the rib angle, there's hypomobility, and you can reproduce the patient's pain when you spring on the rib. And those are four really good clinical indicators of a rib dysfunction as well. So I think both is, I think both matters. And I think if you want to add this information to the ICD and you can just Add like radiation of symptoms with rib, yeah. rib springing. Yeah. So test fo these four things and add and uh, add like symptoms of radiation of down the arm with rib springing. Okay. And that should be enough to actually diagnose this patient. When you go back to the clinic, and I want you to pay attention to this because you will find female patients with this problem a lot, especially patients with thoracic pain, T4 syndrome kind of symptoms. Because this, this, is, this is very, very common. Sometimes the symptoms are not very severe because they have other problems, co coexisting problems like T4 syndrome. But I think you will see that in the clinic if, you, if you're paying attention to a lot of rib problems. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything you want to add, Dr. Sreek? No. Okay. We'll do a little Q&A at the end. And do you want to demonstrate these techniques? You can just do all these techniques to me. Okay, I can. Yeah. So just to make it more fun for you guys, uh, Dr. Singh is going to go ahead and run through the different manual therapy techniques that he did on his patient. Takes like three minutes because he's trained and efficient, but that way you guys can get a, get to see some of these techniques in action. Okay. So we'll start with like a thoracic manipulation and then we'll show you a good manipulation. Are we okay there? Yeah. I think we can unplug. I think we're okay. Yeah, so. Standing back. So basically, I mean, you can, it, it doesn't hurt to actually manipulate the mid thoracic if you're finding problems with third, fourth, fifth rib. So on that side. So what you do is either you can use this grip or you can use this grip. Yeah, I'll actually show them. Yeah, sure. So either you can keep your hand like this or you can keep your hand like this or you can keep your hand like this. It's up to you. And the idea is that you're trying to get the spinous process in your mid palmar crease. Okay, so you're trying to get the spinous process to lock here. Okay. 
Yeah. And what you can do is you can, I like to do this way, but it's a little non-dominant side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to flex it to the segment and try to rotate a little bit. And just do a little, it's hard to do it on the non-dominant side, but yeah. and we can just do a little thrust. Perfect. Yeah. For rib dysfunctions, I like to do this. They have some stomach for me. So, yeah, just So the springing could also be. What you're trying to do is you're trying to find the rib angles. That's the most prominent part of the rib. So you can find a rib angle, okay, and you find the opposite transverse process on the opposite side. So if you're doing on the left. You're trying to find the transverse process on the opposite side, and and all you're doing is just a quick thrust, quick thrust. Okay, you can do it for third rib, fourth rib, fifth rib, and hence forth. You can go, I think, until eighth rib or so. Okay. Another thing you can do is if you're finding silent dysfunction, you can treat the upper cervical. So lay on your. Yeah. So what you can do is I'll just show you C12 manipulation. I like to not do this or do this because I like to manipulate in like initial range. Okay. Some people like to do like pre-manipulative holds. You can do a cervical screening test for ailer ligament, transverse ligament before you do this. But I'll just show you a quick all you're doing is just to, in initial range though, the idea is to manipulate in initial range, no side bending, no rotation, because this, this kinks the vertebral artery. So we just wanna, if you wanna manipulate, we just wanna manipulate in just a little bit of side bending, contralateral rotation, and just do a little quick, just do a quick, like kind of a, kind of a flick, okay? You guys know what the difference is between a well-trained PT and a well-trained chiropractor? A well-trained PT, the manual therapy techniques are more specific, they're more gentle, and they're more safe, and they're more comfortable for the patient. And so I just want to let you guys know there's a big difference in you know, how manual therapy techniques are performed and how the patient perceives these. I've had so many patients come to me that are so scared of manipulation because they had a rough manipulation from a chiropractor and they won't even let me do it. They're so scared, they're so traumatized. And so when we teach you guys these techniques, we're gonna teach you the osteopathic way, which is the minimal amount of force needed with the most precise um, you know, direction and technique and hand placement and stuff like that. It's way better. It's Trust me, if you guys have had manipulations done, if you've had a nice one, it's amazing. If you've had a rough one, it's traumatic. We've, we've all been there probably. I remember actually going to a chiropractor uh, several years ago. And I, my diagnosis about myself was C12 dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And he manipulated my, he, he, he was able to fix the dysfunction, but I could feel that he manipulated everything from C1 to T1 <laughs> with one technique. And that's not a good idea that's because, idea. because <laughs> you can cause a lot of, a lot of muscle soreness and pain and secondary symptoms to the patients. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Anything else you want us to show you guys? Okay, okay. I think a lot. Of, I think we'll take some questions. Let me let me demonstrate one more thing real quick, and then we'll take some questions. Okay. So I don't know about you guys, but I've had a lot of patients who have rib dysfunctions. There's this is not an established like test or anything like that, but patients who have rib dysfunction on a particular side. They'll say, you know, I've noticed that when I try to reach like this, that it hurts. That when I try to reach like this, it hurts. I had a patient come into my clinic this week. She's a patient and I treat her for, she has this rib dysfunction. Probably like two or three times a year, her rib goes into dysfunction. And one time she came to me and I fixed it for her. 
And so now, anytime she feels that rib go into dysfunction, she calls the clinic. Can I see Dr. Steve first thing in the morning? She comes to me first thing in the morning. She lays down. We check it. We pop it. And this, this is her test. She says, when I can do this and it doesn't hurt, then I know that you fixed it. And she's not the only patient like that. So sometimes you might have a patient that says, when I reach like this, hurts by my shoulder blade or hurts in my arm. So that's something that you can check for. You should be suspicious of rib dysfunctions, guys. I mean, this, this particular diagnosis, definitely, but be suspicious of rib dysfunctions. If you're treating a neck patient, a thoracic patient, or an upper extremity patient, they will have a rib dysfunction, I promise you. And typically it's in the first six ribs that there's a dysfunction. So anyways, yeah, we'll open it up for q and I'll give you Dr. Singh. Thank you, Dr. Steve. Yep. Uh, can anybody tell me why this person patient had, is reporting, this patient is reporting pain with this? Any Anybody who can tell me? Like what is the clinical reasoning why the rib, rib dysfunction patient is giving you symptoms with this? I did not do me or lips technique. I did, I did C one two minute. But I can show. I can definitely show you me and lips technique at some point of time. Okay. Costochondritis. Yes. I mean, what is the clinical reasoning if you have a rib dysfunction? So the question is, if you have a rib dysfunction, why this is painful? Anybody? What is causing? You have to think biomechanically. What is what what is what what has gone wrong with pectoral muscle? Anybody? Tightness. Okay. I'm looking for a better term. Facet impinges. We are not talking about costovertebral. We're talking about. We're talking about. We're not talking about. We're talking about costo transverse dysfunction. Okay, hyperactive. I'm still looking for a better word. Like the terminology we should use. The terminology that is widely accepted for these kind of problems. Trigger point, I mean, sympathetic upregulation. Muscle adhesions, I mean, all these, all these things are correct, but I think the terminology we should use for this is hypertonicity. Every time a dysfunction happens, there are certain muscles that become hypertonic and hypotonic. When we do documentation and stuff, we like to use these terms because these terms are standardized. So you use words like hypertonic or hypotonic, dominant or non-dominant, okay? So what happens is this patient has Pectoralis minor or major hypertonicity. Pectoralis minor hypertonicity is very common. So doc, what Dr. Steve was explaining, this patient had probably pectoralis minor hypertonicity and that's why a patient had difficulty doing this. Okay. Okay, we're gonna take some q and I mean, all of you who are, especially the seasoned clinicians who have been practicing for a while, if you guys see ICBN in the clinic, please do text me on WhatsApp group because I think you will, if you start, I think mm -hmm. even like next week, if you go back to the clinic and you start assessing patients with thoracic pain, and I'm yeah. sure you will see one or two in the clinic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, Because it's way more common, way more common than you think. Okay. Anything you want to add, Dr. Steve? Ugh. No, no, it's been a good. Yeah. Okay. So any questions, guys? So I did, I did see someone said um, maybe trigger points in the muscle. So let me, let me jump on that soapbox really quickly. So <clears throat> I just want to let you guys know that as far as trigger points go, <clears throat> there's really two sources of trigger points. There's two. There's two sources of trigger points. So one is that a muscle is made to work way too hard over the course of time, right? So say poor posture, right? Poor posture, upper trapezius and levator scap are having to work so hard and then they develop ischemia, hypoxia, and they develop trigger points and, and stuff like that, right? They're fatigued. A ATP is fatigued, muscle is fatigued and stuff like that. So it is possible that you can have a primary trigger point problem, 
But I think most commonly, even more common than that, is when you have a joint dysfunction in the body, when you have a dysfunction in the body, when you have a joint dysfunction in the body, some muscles in that area become hypertonic and like a spasm and other, other muscles become hypotonic and they go on holiday. That's why we have classic muscle imbalances, right? If you're treating a neck, upper traps and levator scapula are going to be tight. Scalenes are going to be tight. The deep neck flexors are going to be weak. And it's every time, like it's almost every time in low back and pelvic um, patients that we treat. The, some of the lumbar paraspinals will go on to spasm. Piriformis will go on to spasm. But the core, gluteus medius, transverse abdominis, there's, there's muscles that are just commonly um, um, shut down or inhibited. And so when we talk about trigger points in the muscles, I, I, I want you to have this meta view. When you see a trigger point or a patient, patient complains of a trigger point, you need to ask yourself, is there a joint dysfunction? Is there a movement dysfunction? Is it a posture issue? Because if you just hijama cup, if you do hijama cupping, if you do soft tissue, foam rolling, you know, um, Graston, IA stim, whatever, whatever you do to that trigger point, if we don't address the cause of the trigger point, which is either posture, repetitive micro trauma, or joint dysfunction, then you're never going to fully resolve that. And what, what will happen is the patient will see you a few times and then they'll move on to the next person seeking permanent relief, real relief. So yeah, I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, that's our okay. that's our take. That's I our think, view I, on think, I think it's a good idea to discuss some exercises and discuss differential diagnosis in a little more detail. I think I think it will it will help. So and we will try to cover all these all these problems. So my patient has symptoms here, right? Okay. Primary nerve supply here. If you talk about the three major nerves, it could be median or maybe like ulnar. If you I go a little lower, okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Median sits on the middle side of the biceps tendon. This is where you can palpate median nerve. So it could be a median nerve entrapment around the pronator teres. Okay. And then median branches into anterior interosseous here, goes into the forearm, supplies the three muscles. Your flexor pollis is longus, your flexor digitum profundus, and pronator quadratus, right? So it could be also an anterior interosseous problem, but the, the patient should not have chest pain if you have a, it's an anterior interosseous problem or a median nerve entrapment here. Okay. Your patient could also have like a radiculopathy where they have a nerve root entrapment here. Okay. A nerve root entrapment should not also give you chest pain unless they have a secondary rib dysfunction. Okay. Golfer's elbow is tendonitis of the which, which I think is easy to rule out by doing a resisted exercise. I mean, it's very easy to rule it out. Medial cord syndrome can happen because your, your medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm that is getting entrapped or getting supplied by intercostal brachial nerve comes from the medial cord and it can get entrapped in the, in the, in the axilla or maybe below the clavicle. Okay. And then you can also have ulnar neuropathy, but ulnar neuropathy should extend all the way down. You know how not neuropathies present, right? They could present from distal to proximal. So this patient should have numbness tingling in the on the middle side of the middle side of the hand. Okay. And then can also have like a lower trunk entrapment. And lower trunk entrapment, C A T1, the patient should have everything involved from here to here. C A T1, right? The idea here is that this patient only has symptoms because your medial cutaneous nerve does not supply below eight to 10 centimeters below your forearm. So this is the area your patient will present symptoms with. Okay. And we usually, if you want to palpate the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm, you can actually palpate or dissect, like it's like eight centimeters below your, below your distal. So you find the elbow crease, you measure eight centimeters, this is where your medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm is. And this is where we record it. This is where we can palpate it. Some, in some patients, we can palpate it. Okay. So the symptoms are just localized in this region when you're talking about this diagnosis. Okay. And it's very easy to differentiate between differentiate between other diagnoses if you if you if you know the accurate anatomy of this nerve and can correlate with thoracic springing and spring test and all the four things Dr. Steve was saying. Okay. And this is a complex diagnosis, but that's how you become an expert if you can diagnose complex problems efficiently. Okay. We'll talk about T4 syndrome in like, I think next few lectures. And I think we're going to talk about this diagnosis again, because mm. this 
ICBN entrapment, I've seen coexist with T4 syndrome a lot, okay? Because thoracic, I mean, T4 syndrome is basically causing primary dysfunctions in thoracic spine and secondary dysfunction is in costal transfers or second, third, fourth, fifth rib. So they can coexist with T4 syndrome. And I think I'm trying to actually publish a paper on T4 syndrome and we'll talk about that, that in like future lectures, okay? Uh, doc, uh, Dr. Steve, do you mind showing an exercise for specific exercise for this kind of problem? Absolutely. What would you work yeah. on? Let me come, let me come. So we definitely want to work on thoracic mobility because yeah. I mean, this patient also has dysfunction in the thoracic spine. All right. So when I look at exercise prescription, you know, obviously we want to look at the deficits that the patient has, but what are we going to do on the first day? So we've already done manipulations. We've cleaned out the issue. And now what we want to do is we want to give the patient tools to finish cleaning up the issue, to make sure the issue does not come back. And clearly in this patient's case, you know, thoracic mobility and rib mobility are two of the, of the main problems that we need to start on for now, right? Later, we might address posture and muscle imbalance and stuff like that. But if you had to ask me, you know, what, you know, maybe if I was going to give the patient like two exercises, which two exercises would I give? The first one I would do is where we take like a a rolled up towel or a foam roll that the patient can lay over. Do you have like a towel or something? Bring some. So the first one I would do is when we have like a towel or a foam roll on the mat and the patient lays over that towel or foam roll and does self thoracic extension mobilizations. Thoracic extension is usually limited. And when we have rib dysfunctions, we need to mobilize thoracic spine. So Dr. Singh is going to grab a, a tool for that. And then I'll show you the other one. I also like uh, upper trunk rotations, but I do them a little bit differently. So for upper trunk rotations, right, patients laying on their side, knees are bent, arms straight out, you're going to lift up this top arm. When the top arm is in line with the chest, the arm is not going to go further back, right? The arm and the chest will move together. You're going to go as far as they can. When the patient gets as far as they can go, right? We're getting thoracic rotation, we're getting um, pec major, pec minor. And then at this point, I wanna do something for the ribs. And so I'll point to the front of their chest and I'll say, I want you to breathe in as deeply as you can. Breathe in, breathe out. So we're getting thoracic mobility, but we're also getting some rib mobility as well. And then I'll have the patient do maybe 10 or 15 repetitions on this side. And then we'll do the other side. So that will be for thoracic rotation and rib mobility. And then using like a rolled up towel or something. You want to put the towel at the, just underneath. You want the towel to be just underneath where the patient is hypomobile or stiff so that we can mobilize the segment above the towel hands behind the neck, and we're gonna lean back over the top. We can do repetitive motions here and mobilize that, or we can have the patient lay there statically and do some breathing. Breathing is very important when we're dealing with rib dysfunctions, we should do some breathing. If the patient's had a chest pain or rib dysfunction, the odds are that they're not like, getting full excursion from their rib cage because of pain. The, the, the brain will say, no, we're not doing that. And the patient might have a very shallow breathing. We can even do some snow angels while we're here, which is good for chest, shoulder, thoracic spine, ribs. It's good for so many things. This, is, this exercise is actually a great one-stop shop and we can do it in supine. We can do it standing up against the wall, which is gonna be a little bit more of a challenge. Knees bent back flat, arms here, and move the arms up and down along the wall. I go until the patient feels resistance. So I get resistance right here because my lats and my pecs are ridiculously tight. I'm an old man. 
So there's my resistance. So I'm just going to go up till I feel resistance there and then come back down. And we might do like three sets of 10. The final variation of this exercise is, is going gonna, is gonna to include the mobility component, but it's also going to, we're also going to include now mid traps, lower traps, um, and some of the thoracic extensors. And so you would start off on the table, then you would come to the wall, and maybe after a session or two, we'll go prone. Let me show you the version in prone. Just check the camera. That's probably good. Actually. I think that's probably good. There. There. So if you had to ask me which two exercises I would start them off with, thoracic extension and thoracic rotation, um, maybe with some breathing component. And that would be a good starting point. And then we'd get into some other things from there. But, you know, this is a, this is a short lecture. We want to show you guys kind of what we're about and, the, you know, the level, of, the level of thinking and stuff like that. And I hope that you guys will join us for full courses that we're going to be offering. Um, and I think that, do we have someone on our team like Prashant or Drumi that can talk a little bit about I think, that? I think let's give time to Drumi. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you have any more questions, guys? Any more questions? I think Drumi will come and talk about the quiz and we'll talk about the courses we are offering. Drumi, are you there? Yes, sir. Okay. So, hello everyone. Good evening. So, we are going to conduct the quiz on Instagram. We are going to post a quiz on Instagram. The story will be up and the post will be up. You have to comment your answers on the post. And whether it be right or wrong, you just have to attempt it. Please try to attempt all the questions. We will be posting five questions. Okay. And the certificate of participation will be then given to you after you answer on the post. Yeah, okay. So I'll be sharing I, the link soon I, with you. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I think the questions are harder. So we just don't want to judge you on these questions because this is a very difficult topic and it's a, it's a difficult quiz. But I mean, I think, you, I think you will learn something from this and that's the whole, whole, whole reason of doing this just because this is not a simple, simple topic. So the quizzes will be very challenging. Yeah. yeah. Over to you, Dhrumi. Yeah, that's it. Uh, I'll be sharing all the details of the quiz and the link of the quiz on the group of ICBN. And you have to reply to that post within an hour and then we will share the certificates with you. Also, we are starting with our first batch soon and we, are, we still have the 25% discount on. So grab your seats valuable seats i would say so yes we have two modules online and offline so online modules consist of online lectures that will be held every last weekend of each month okay four hours on saturday four hours on sunday you will be given all the credit hours for the same and the offline consists of two weeks of hands-on training, one in September or October and one in March and April next year. Mm -hmm. Let me say something. You guys, our first cohort is going to be really special. And here's why. We want to take people in our first cohort. We want to take physiotherapists that are willing, physiotherapists maybe that have good experience or physiotherapists that want to put in the time and effort we want, uh, we want to do a really good job with our cohort and, and teach wonderful things and stuff like that. But one of our goals, not besides making physiotherapists better, helping you guys enjoy your jobs and stuff, is to create mentors. We are looking to create the next generation of leaders of physical therapists in India and, and around the world. And in our first cohort, we're going to be looking for talented individuals. You don't have to be the smartest. Maybe you're a hard worker. I'm not the fastest learner in the world, but I work hard. I spend time with repetition and stuff like that. So, so it could be anybody, 
Um, but we really wanted we want to develop some mentors that are going to do a couple of things for Gem in the future. We're looking for people that can come alongside us that may be able to teach with us in India, around India, because Dr. Singh and I cannot be everywhere. And we'll be coming to India, you know, once or twice a year to do in-person courses and stuff like that. But we're looking for mentors who are going to potentially teach for us. And as a result, make, you know, make some degree of income and stuff like that. We're also looking for these mentors because our goal is that this is going to turn into a fellowship program. It's not like take our courses and you're done. We want to have the option for our students who have completed half or more of the courses to be able to work with an expert therapist for, we haven't decided how long it's going to be yet, not too long, but not too short, to work alongside some of the best therapists in India and be able to discuss with them cases, to be able to see patients together, have that mentor give feedback, say, we need to work on this technique. You need help with this technique. Let me help you with this complex diagnosis. Let's brainstorm together. Let's be a think tank together. And it makes you better. Dr. Singh and I, I don't know your fellowship program, Dr. Singh. I had to do 440 hours working with a mentor. We are not going to require that much. That's eight hours a week for a whole year. We're not going to require that much. The, requir the requirement will be less. Um, it's still going to be something that you have to invest in, but you're going to come out as a better therapist. This is this is really where Dr. Singh and I became better because until then it's head knowledge, right? You, you get the courses, you see the techniques, you practice them a little bit, but to have someone that you actually work with that's at a higher level than you, they will bring you up to that level. And so we want out of our first batch, out of our first cohort, we are lo actively looking for therapists that can fill this role. And so what it would look like if you become a mentor with us, you might be able to teach with us if you want to, we're not going to force it. If you wanted, if you were willing to have students, you know, our GEM students come to your clinic and spend time with you treating patients, there would be a degree of, of, of tuition for this fellowship program. And so to serve as a mentor, whether you're teaching or facilitating students, there would be a degree of, you know, of income, of, of money for your time and effort that's there and stuff like that. So we're looking to create this, this larger network of better therapists and stuff like that. We've seen it done here in the United States. It works very well um, in different parts of the world. It works very well. And um, it's 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 going to be really cool. So, you know, whether you attend one course here, one course there, or you sign up for our certification program and you don't want to be a mentor or you're like, you know what, I would love to serve as a mentor. I would love to get into teaching with GEM, this this company that's an international company that has courses that are taught all over the place and stuff like that. Um, just throwing that out there, guys, you know, it's, it's for your consideration. And, you know, we are running a discount right now. We're really eager to get as as large of a first cohort as we can. And that's why we're putting on these free lectures to kind of show you guys where, what we're about and what we're doing and, and stuff like that. And hopefully you guys are energized and excited because it's a different level. It's we're bringing the pinnacle of physical therapy education to you guys. So anyways, yeah, thank you. I think uh, Dr. Steve, just one more point. I think people ask me why the program is one year, why it's not a two month program or why it's not a one week program or a weekend course. I mean. So most of the fellowship programs in the United States has to be at least 12 months or more, okay? And that is in addition to the hands-on training, which Dr. Steve was talking about. The hands-on training could vary from 150 hours to 440 hours. That's, I'm talking about US standards. So once we convert this program into a fellowship program, we will add like some hands-on training. And that's why we are recruiting mentors. We can train those mentors and I think we have this self-realization that we can't teach everybody, I think. And we, we want to train people so that they, they can really, really improve the standards of care in India and, of course, in the United States as well. So anything you want to add, Dr. Steve, through me? Yeah, I did. Um, you said something ago that I wanted to jump on. Um, the hours, um, the fellowship program. Um, uh, no, I don't remember what it was. So, so many of the times people ask, what is the syllabus? What are you going to teach? Like, can you just cover up? Let me, what yeah. Syllabus you are going T to? TJ, feel free to fill in the gaps. Okay, so here's, here's ideally what we're going to do. We're going to cover the entire body 
cervical, shoulder, elbow, wrist, back, SI joint, hip, knee, ankle, foot. We're going to cover the entire body with courses that are going to be shaped more or less like this. What's the anatomy and physiology? What's the biomechanics? What are the special, you know, what are the special tests? What are the differential diagnosis? What are the manual therapy techniques? How do we treat these diagnoses in an evidence-based fashion, which is using evidence, but also using clinical reasoning. We want to help you guys have better clinical reasoning because many diagnoses are not as they seem. There's other things going on. There's other causes behind the problems. And if you want to be a very effective therapist, you need to diagnose very quickly and very effectively and treat quickly and effectively. And then one of the ways that we're going to make GEM better than what we've done before is we want to give you guys a start to finish education. In other words, how do you examine the patient? How do we do manual therapy and dry needling and maybe some soft tissue techniques and stuff like that? And then what do we give the patient in terms of exercises? We are going to have, um, in every course that we teach, we're going to have um, extensive you know, exercises. How do you do it correctly? How does it help? You know, there's a thousand exercises on Google. We want to show you guys the most effective exercises. Sometimes you can do 10 exercises to accomplish one thing. Sometimes you can do one exercise and you can accomplish those same things. What exercises are specific? Yes, you can do serratus anterior by doing bear hugs, but you can also make serratus anterior work like it should in the range of motion that it should, and it's more functional. So we're going to be coming at it from a functional exercise standpoint. You want this muscle to work. Doing clamshells is great, but doing clams does not help the patient have pelvic stability in standing. We have to train pelvic stability in standing. And so it's it's much more specific. It's much more real world. It's it's We call it functional exercises or functional activities. And so we're, we want to have this start to finish. And then what do you give your patients for home? Patients are not going to go home and do 20 home exercises. They're not. But if you can show them, this is the exercise that you need. We did this exercise. It made you feel better. This is the exercise, two or three exercises that you need to, to address this problem with, you know, working with me and stuff like that. So, so learning how to educate patients and get buy-in and get understanding from the patients that they'll do, you know, the two or three exercises that are, that are effective. We don't want to give a thousand. They won't do them. You guys know they won't do them. Um, so you know, it's really, it's really, I think it's the most comprehensive, holistic um, education that's going to be out there as far as what we're trying to accomplish. The other thing is it cannot be a two month program because it's not about cramming it in our heads and getting the certificate and hanging the certificate on the wall. You guys need time. I don't, I don't know about you guys, but I did. I needed time to absorb the information, practice it in the clinic, and then once I was, you know, mastered a little bit more, then you take the next course and then you add a little bit more. What we're trying to do is we're trying to change the whole approach, the whole philosophy, the whole mentality behind what is physical therapy. And that cannot happen in one month or two months. We don't want you guys to just have skills and no clinical reasoning or have clinical reasoning and no skills. And, and both of these things take time to develop. And we're not just talking about the shoulder. We're talking about the whole body. And so it's, it's really, um, it's really a, a massive thing from start to finish. We're going to cover everything. There will be some electives. So we are going to include some other things in case you guys are interested in this or maybe you know sports specific conditions dealing with runners treating cricket players treating temporomandibular joint dysfunction dealing with concussion we're going to have a variety of different um you know electives just outside of the outside of the one year program that are there and you guys will you know we might mandate that you have to take one or two electives but there's going to be plenty that you won't have to take but you can if you're interested so i mean it, i think it's just a great program i think it's really something that has the potential to be, you know, life changing, you know, career changing. Um, and you guys should consider jumping in, you know, try out a couple of courses and see what you think. I think you won't be disappointed. Anything you want to add, Dr. Thrumi? Okay. I think, I think we're good for the day. I mean, we, we I think, thank you, Dr. Steve for your time. Thank you, Thrumi. I mean, you guys can answer questions on Instagram or other social media and, 
have fun, I guess. I think thank you for your time.